Hi, Chris. Hi, Henry. How are you doing? Very good. You? Not too bad. This is your first blogging heads, I believe. That's right, it is. Well, in the best tradition of blogging heads, unfortunately, we started with some technical difficulties, as a result of which uh, you will see me, or rather the uh, viewers will see me when we actually uh, put this up, uh, wearing a pair of slightly goofy-looking uh, Bluetooth headphones, because this is the only way that I could uh, effectively uh, sort of figure out some sort of mic combination at home to work. That's too bad so, I can't see that. Well, I guess you'll have the uh, you'll have the pleasure of viewing it when it go it, it all goes up. Anyway, uh, this is a uh, slightly unusual blogging heads, I guess, and that usually it's uh, two people going back and forth against each other on issues of the day. But this is going to be uh, much more of an interview with you about your recent book, which I am about to hold up to the uh, camera, uh, which is probably going to uh, register in reverse. Uh, but that Storm World by uh, Chris Mooney, it uh, came out about, what, two months ago at this stage? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say one about one, yeah. Yeah, hurricanes, politics, and the battle over global warming. And this is, it's, it's a fun book. It's a uh, book which I recommend to everybody watching this. But I think it's also it's a, it's a pretty interesting book in terms of what it says about the politics of science. And maybe where we can start is by talking about some of the ways in which this book is different from the, uh, from the book of yours that I first read, and which I helped organize a, a seminar around on Crooked Timber, the blog that I co-run, which was The Republican War on Science. And that was a book which was all about the, uh, effectively the politics of science, where we saw political disagreements uh, coming to the forefront over the interpretation of science, and the science to some extent being pushed back more or less deliberately by people uh, in the Republican side of the aisle in particular. You argued that this was something which was uh, quite unusual, that science is always politicized, but that this was far more so than in the past. Whereas in this book, uh, the uh, politics definitely features, but it's what takes the backstage, and it seems to me to be much more a story of uh, a specifically scientific controversy, how it arose, where it came from, and how this has a sort of how this has consequences for politics. So the causation in the story seems to me to be the other way around. I think that's probably pretty accurate. Uh, as a writer, I didn't really want to write a predictable sequel to the Republican War on Science, so I didn't do another outrage book. You know, I consider myself a science journalist and a political journalist, some sort of weird hybrid between them. And I think you're right that Stormworld's more of a science book, and Republican War on Science is more of a politics book. And, uh, and so you start the book, uh, and you know, forgive me for going through some of the stuff that the book says, which you know very well already, but for the benefit of you people watching this, so you start this book uh, way back in the 19th century. You, are, you argue in a certain sense that many of the controversies that we see uh, today over the relationship between global warming and hurricanes had their beginnings in uh, scientific feuds in the 19th century, and in particular in the uh, debate over whether or not one should go to empirical evidence, one should uh, rely on evidence, or whether instead one should seek to uh, model processes and uh, accept some of the uh, necessary costs that come with that in order to figure out what is actually going on in terms of causation. Right. At least there's some strong parallels between the current debate and earlier very fraught arguments in the field of meteorology over what storms actually are. And I don't want to make too much of the parallels except to say that there has long been a divide in meteorology and in other fields between more theoretically inclined scientists and the scientists who are more uh, comfortable with doing kind of data crunching and observational analysis. And one of the things I was a little puzzled by, why is this? Because uh, one of the things that you seem to suggest in the book is that these kinds of uh, divisions are much stronger in the U.S. than they are in other parts of the world where uh, people work, you know, where climatologists and meteorologists uh, work side by side. Well, you know, every scientist has a comfort zone, and certainly there's some sort of polymaths or sort of jacks of all trades out there who are good at using a lot of different scientific approaches. But without a doubt, some scientists become more familiar with looking at observational data, while others become much more familiar with doing types of modeling and in climate science, you know, sophisticated computer modeling. And so, you know, it's, it's comfort zones, and, you know, certainly it's not completely black or white where scientists have to be in either one camp or the other. Um, but they do break down this way to a significant extent. And I argued in the book that there was less of a divide in Europe between sort of the data guys and the modeler guys than there is in the United States. And I said that that was partly perhaps because um, with, with in, any, in any event with the UK Meteorological Office and the Hadley Center, which is the climate part of the UK Meteorological Office, I went there to work on the book, and they're actually all working in the same building. Uh, whereas in the USA, different branches of the scientific government scientific enterprise are actually very far apart. 
So a lot of it basically depends on whether or not the, uh, the guy or the woman who you are agreeing or disagreeing with happens to be on the same corridor in the same building as you, and you observe, you pick up stuff um, sort of through corridor talk and whatever, which makes you perhaps more inclined to see the other viewpoint than you might otherwise be. Yeah, I mean, it's a subtle thing. I don't want to make too, too much of, of that particular personal interaction, but I doubt, I don't think it's insignificant. Um, that they are in the same place. And I think this is a divide that we have to break down because obviously we need both kinds of science. Science works best when data or observations and theory kind of mesh and then we suddenly really know what's going on. So we need scientists who are good at both to, to compare notes and to finally end up on the same page. And you suggest that uh, Ram Emanuel, who is uh, one of the foremost figures in some of the controversies surrounding this, is somebody who actually pretty, pretty well exemplifies that combination of, on the one hand, being interested in the data, and on the other hand, being uh, prepared to go out there and explore these uh, computer models of what they can tell us. Yeah, it's really ironic. This is Kerry Emanuel. He's uh, leading the sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, I said Ram, who, of course, <laughs> is the political guy. Sorry. <laughs> we're switching from political to science yeah. and back again. He's, um, you know, perhaps uh, the leading hurricane theoretician in some ways based at MIT. And what's so ironic in some ways is that um, his 2005 paper, which really kicked off the, the very vigorous phase of the hurricane global warming debate, was a data-based analysis. Yeah, so this was, a, this was in effect a, a sort of modeler who was actually getting his hands dirty with the data. And to some extent, in some of this uh, turf war stuff that he was uh, perceived as uh, treading on, sort of treading in areas that were perhaps the, uh, perhaps the preserve of uh, other scientists, or is, was this more purely a, sort of a, a, a debate and an argument over the data? Uh, I think it was a debate over the data largely. I think that some scientists uh, were viewed as, as being new to the hurricane field. As in particular, a lot of people who you might traditionally think of as, quote, climate scientists have been moving into studying hurricanes as the subject has been hot. But that's not true of Emmanuel. He's been in this field for 20 years, so he knows all the people. And I don't think that that would have been something held against him. Yeah, well, maybe if you can talk a little bit more about the modeling side, because this is something that the people who, uh, uh, what's your, I can't remember your word for people who are skeptics on this, you have a specific term of art that you use, but a lot of people who, uh, who are, sort of say, uh, professional skeptics of global warming, uh, base their attacks on the idea that computer models don't necessarily tell us all that much about the world, that this is basically a bunch of people figuring, uh, feeding in figures into complicated mathematical equations which may or may not have any real world relevance and therefore we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be attaching any uh, sort of significance to the arguments or the claims that they make. Uh, could you tell us about some of the reasons why you disagree with this? Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, the global warming debate is often uh, involved from the, quote, skeptic side, attacks on the models and saying the models, you know, aren't in alignment with the data, which is sort of misleading, of course, because data gets fed into models. Um, and uh, in the end, of course, we need a, a good theoretical understanding that we get from models and we need good observational data. Um, so I, I, I disagree. It's not an either or. It has to be a both and. Uh, in terms of the relationship between data and modeling. And uh, we know that models necessarily, uh, in some sense, oversimplify whatever it is that they're trying to study. They have to. The atmosphere, ocean system, or whatever it is, the climate system, are massively complex, and you cannot write every single detail into your equations and then iterate it out ever, however many times. But the scientists do have gotten quite good at getting sort of the essentials in there. And without a doubt, models, especially when you run different models, and they all provide a similar result, are very useful in terms of informing us. Now, sometimes with climate models, you can't think of them as the same way you would think of a, a seven-day weather forecast. Um, rather, they present a range of scenarios, and you look at the scenarios, and you think these are possible futures. And that's useful information that definitely should not be ignored. Well, that, that also is something which I think you uh, tackle in what I found a pretty useful way in the book, which is uh, the uh, argument of some people like, like, I believe, Bill Gray, which goes something along the lines of, well, if they can't predict the uh, sort of weather a week or two weeks in advance, why the hell is it that they think they can predict what's going to happen to the climate 50 or 100 years from now? And this is, there's, a, there's an error there, which you talk about in the book, and maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about why this is a... You know, to be frank, a, a dumb claim or a dumb argument against against the uh, use of uh, climate modeling. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, when you think about the weather, everybody knows about the butterfly effect, as it's called, or chaos, and how, you know, sort of slight differences in the initial conditions, if you sort of run out too far, they make it hard to predict out beyond, you know, I guess seven to ten days for the weather. Some people maybe say seven to, seven to twelve days, whatever the case. Uh, with the climate, you're studying different things, and certainly some things about the climate are very predictable at a longer term than that. And just, you know, for an obvious example, think about the seasons. We can predict the seasons. Everybody knows that the seasons are going to change, and that, you know, in, at least in the northern hemisphere, December is going to be a lot colder than August. Uh, that's because these are things they're controlled on a much uh, larger scale and they are predictable. So climate, and some, another thing that is predictable in this way is the effect of greenhouse gases upon the global climate system. Yeah, so, that's so and as you argue, there seems to be very little doubt among people that greenhouse gases are going to have some sort of effect on hurricanes over the longer term. People do disagree and there's a lot of room for legitimate disagreement over whether or not and sort of over how, how severe the impact of this is going to be and whether or not we're seeing any of the impact at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a no-brainer that if you have global warming, it's going to have all kinds of different repercussions. And it's hard for me or for other scientists to see how hurricanes would suddenly be left out of the picture. I mean, you're talking about storms that are essentially heat engines, and they draw their energy from the warm sea surface, and they sort of process it up to the atmosphere. They use it to do work along the way. That's where we get the devastating winds and waves and so forth and so on. If you're changing the heat content of the sea surface, uh, among other things, then obviously you're going to be changing hurricanes in some way. Precisely what way, that's where the debate gets quite fraught. But already there's an expectation that there should be at least some intensification of the average hurricane because you're storing up more energy in the top layer of the ocean. Yeah, so that the, uh, and my understanding of the science from reading this and from reading, I guess, as a, uh, as somebody who, who has a uh, passing interest in this, is that there is uh, more agreement over whether or not we're going to see intensification of hurricanes than there is over whether we're going to see, uh, an, a, 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 whether we're going to see an increase in the frequency of hurricanes, or at the very least, the, uh, sort of the latter claims have only more recently begun to become more accepted among scientists studying this. Right. Well, it's, it's complex because you think about all the different characteristics of hurricanes. I mean, you can see, you can conceive of a lot of them changing. And one of them is how intense can the hurricane become? What is the maximum potential intensity achievable? And that's where a lot of the debate that I talk about in the book is focused. But there's the issue of how many storms a year will there be in the different basins of the world that have hurricanes. There's the issue of will you see some change in the average size of a hurricane? Their size is very dramatically. What about the regions in which they form, the areas to which they are able to travel or where they make landfall? Uh, what about, you know, if global warming affects El Nino, then El Nino will in turn affect hurricanes? There's so many complexities, and not all of them have been adequately studied. So this is a young field of scientific research. A lot of new scientists are going into the area, and we're going to have better answers in the long term because of that. And one of the things which you say in the book is that, uh, is that the uh, damage that hurricanes cause has a nonlinear relationship with the uh, actual wind speed and the, uh, sort of the size of the hurricane, so, in other words, uh, we, uh, so that in other words we can expect exponentially greater damage as storms increase, and sort of, uh, as storms increase in intensity. Is that, that correct? Oh, sure. So a landfalling tropical storm doesn't cause anything near the damage of a landfall in Category 3, Category 4, Category 5 hurricane. If you, if you plot the damage, it's sort of a dramatic upward slope. It's not, uh, it's not a linear progression in any way, uh, shape, or form. And also, you know, when you think about Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina was a strong Category 3 storm at landfall, but one of the things about Katrina was that its size was massive, and the reason the storm surge was so high was because um, this was such a large storm. And in fact, it was, um, if you go back to... Um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the storm, the previous storm um, before Katrina, Hurricane Camille, that uh, had the storm surge record when it hit Mississippi. This was a Category 5 hurricane at landfall, but smaller. So Katrina, as a Category 3 at landfall, was able to drive a bigger surge because of size. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so moving on from the uh, science of the thing into the politics of, uh, of it, uh, can you tell, tell me a little bit more about how this, uh, sort of how this all came to be? Because you depict 
hurricane science at the beginning of this as having been not exactly a scientific uh, backwater, but not a place where a lot of scientists were devoting a lot of attention. Uh, and you've mentioned this already in the, uh, as we've been talking, how it is that scientists have begun to uh, flood into this area. And on the one hand, you seem to have some climatologists, uh, people like Emmanuel and MIT, basically uh, sort, of, you know, sort of plugging numbers into equations. And on the other hand, you have people like uh, Gray, who have managed to uh, you know, sort of land themselves a significant place in the public consciousness by predicting each year how many storms are likely to uh, happen and who rely on a more uh, seat of the pants uh, kind of uh, seat of the pants plus uh, plus um, empirical data uh, and a, a, a based way of uh, sort of seeking to understand what's happening how did this become transformed into first of all the uh, intellectual battlefield that it was and then into the uh, into the political side uh, battlefield that it became Okay, well, yeah, we have to go back a bit into the history of meteorology here. Um, some of the real pioneering early modern work in meteorology was conducted by the Bergen scientists um, in Scandinavia. And what they were doing was they were studying what we call extratropical cyclones. These are the storms that deliver, um, you know, essentially our winter blizzards. And these are the cyclones of the middle and northern latitudes, which is the kind of weather that Europeans had to deal with. Europeans did not get affected by tropical cyclones or hurricanes. So the science was much more advanced in studying these extratropical cyclones than it was in studying hurricanes. So hurricane science had a big lag for a long time. And what really changed that was World War II. Suddenly the United States is fighting all, all over the world, and in particular fighting in the Pacific where there are typhoons and super typhoons. And in fact, we lost some, some ships and a lot of sailors um, because of typhoons and not necessarily knowing as well as we ought to how to predict them. So suddenly there's this huge investment in tropical weather, um, but it still remained many years behind uh, what you might call extratropical weather. So that was one reason there was a time lag in terms of the study of hurricanes. The second reason was that it's, it's widely agreed upon that we had a quiet period in the Atlantic, especially in the 70s and 80s and up through the early 90s, although Hurricane Andrew in 92 was an anomaly, and that quiet period, again, um, made this not as hot an area for study, whereas now we're in a dramatically active period and we're really worried about hurricane damage. And so that's ramped up the intensity. Now if I can transition sort of to the second part of the question, um, not only are we in an active period, but we saw incredible hurricane damage in 2004 with four storms, powerful storms hitting Florida, and then of course in 2005 with Katrina, Rita, Wilma, you know, each one breaking the other's hurricane intensity record and the damage of Katrina to New Orleans, the devastation of course was the number one thing that put this subject on the map. And then the science of hurricanes intersected with the science of climate as all this was happening due to new scientific publications. So it raised the stakes uh, incredibly. So uh, to uh, pun a bad, uh, to make a bad pun, and there seemed to be a number of bad puns, this was a perfect storm in a, in a certain sense, all of these things coming together in a relatively short period of time, uh, not necessarily uh, not necessarily linked, but uh, suddenly a sort of political controversy over climate change in general, uh, scientific developments, plus the fact that we were in a uh, sort of in a uh, more active hurricane season, whether because of whether in part because of global warming, whether in part whether because of uh, other factors, all of these things came together in the same period. Yes, it was definitely the perfect storm. I mean, you can see, if you look back at history in some sense, you can sort of see climate science and hurricane science on a collision course. And you might say that 2004 and 2005 is when they finally did collide. Yeah. Uh, one question which is interesting to me, you know, so one of the key figures in this book is, of course, Bill Gray. He's somebody who uh, you, uh, you clearly disagree with profoundly, but you also find kind of attractive on a personal level. He sounds to be a, a sort of a, a quirky, interesting, um, sort of opinionated uh, kind of person. How do you think the history of this would have developed if there had been somebody, uh, sort of say, a little grayer than gray, uh, a little less and sort of uh, publicly uh, flamboyant than Gray, who had been in the position of being the uh, sort of the dean of meteorology at the time that this all began, began to break. That's a great question. I think some, to some extent, it might have been less fun. Um, Gray has been called the Howard Stern of meteorology, and uh, he is not afraid to speak his mind, whether it's about global warming, global warming and hurricanes, or whatever else. Uh, you know, he's been in the field 50 years. He's trained a lot of the leading scientists of the next generation. Some of them agree, disagree with him, and some of them uh, more generally agree with him. And he feels that at this point in his career, he's going to tell it like it is, and it has certainly made the debate more colorful. And if you had a different kind of sort of statesman 
in this field. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that Gray is sort of the senior person in the field. And if you had someone with a different personality, you know, I think it would have had um, tremendous repercussions for the science and else, uh, otherwise. But, you know, Gray's personality, I think, was one of the things that made him uh, such a good teacher for all of the students that came up under him. So as a journalist, you know, I wrote the Republican War on Science, and I was definitely pretty hard on people who attack the consensus view of global warming. Um, but I think with someone like Bill Gray, he does attack that consensus view. But you also got to give a lot of credit to someone who's been in this field for 50 years and who's pioneered our modern understanding in many ways of hurricanes. And so I tried, I tried to do both, and I tried to have a picture that was itself kind of gray, if you will, allow sort of another bad pun. And one, and one thing that's pretty clear about him is that he is not a, uh, he's not a hack. He hasn't been bought and sold. That uh, whatever the source of his opinions on many of these topics and on many of these, uh, many of his fellow scientists, he's not doing this uh, from the point of view of a personal, uh, you know, personal financial benefit. That this is, uh, this is stuff that he genuinely believes and holds to be true. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's sort of a generational gap in some ways between Gray and the, and the scientists uh, today who are more the climate modelers. I think that Gray not only was empiricism, you know, what he was best at and what he built his career upon, um, but in some sense the modeling wave, uh, I think that in, he missed it in some ways. And so as a result, the way that he does science is just different than the way that a lot of other scientists today do science. Uh, and, and, and both are valid, right? Both are needed perspectives. Uh, what's unfortunate is when one methodological camp starts sort of attacking the other because, of course, we need to bring in as many talented scientists as we can to study the same problem if we're going to get reliable answers. Well, there also seems to be an interesting kind of culture there that uh, sort of he in part embodied and uh, passed on to his students, which is, uh, you know, so on the one hand, he is somebody who uh, sort of really clearly has gotten into the empirical data and who made some real, very substantial contributions back in his time to uh, understanding of sort of how, you know, sort of how, what kinds of relationships you might get from actually uh, sort of studying the, uh, sort of the quantitative data. But on the other hand, there's a, uh, this seat of the pants kind of thing, this idea which seems to come through in the book, that you know, he considers that you're not a real uh, climate scientist, you're not a real storm scientist, unless you've gone into a plane and sort of basically flown, a, flown through a storm, you know, sort of you've seen it, you've observed, you know, so kind of almost a macho sensibility about what it is to be a climate scientist. Yeah, there's a bit of that there. There's also, you know, in terms of, use the phrase, seat of the pants, there's also a bit uh, with Gray, uh, more the view that, that forecasting weather is a bit of an art as well as a science. So, for example, uh, I don't, we didn't mention this. Gray is most famous for putting out an Atlantic hurricane forecast uh, at different times of the year, saying how many storms there are going to be. And he really gets a lot of media attention every time he does it. He reserves the right to sort of shade the forecast up and down based upon what you might call instincts, his sense of what's coming, um, rather than anything you know necessarily completely quantifiable. And you know, the climate modelers or other methodologies wouldn't probably do that. Um, so it sort of harkens back to a different way of doing forecasting in general. And yeah, there's no doubt that you know, for scientists in this field, a rite of passage is flying on an instrumented aircraft into a hurricane in order to take data. And Gray broadens that to say, you know, I've been down in the trenches 50 years gathering data about these storms. You know, don't tell me uh, that you can make these conclusions based upon the data sets that I'm so familiar with when you're not as familiar with them as I am. And that kind of thing happens, yeah. Yeah. and. Uh uh, one question which I wasn't quite sure about after reading the book, how do his fellow meteorologists view Gray at the moment? Because on the one hand, you know, sort of he, uh, he does seem to have some continued support. On the other hand, uh, sort of you mentioned how uh, sort of one of his most prominent students basically had a disagreement with him. And you talk about this uh, panel which effectively collapsed because of uh, Gray basically grandstanding and making some nonsensical, uh, well, maybe uh, some, some, some very strong accusations about what it was that was motivating some of the uh, sort of some of the, some of his fellow scientists. So is he is he still regarded as being part of the community? Is he regarded as being the uh, kind of crazy uncle? How do people like say, for example, uh, Chris Lancy, who comes across as being somebody who agrees with Gray uh, just at least to some degree in terms of his skepticism, but is a sort of uh, much more careful and much more cautious and much more prepared to uh, base his uh, to base his arguments and to base his beliefs on uh, the evidence that's uh, coming in. How do people like this view Gray at the moment? Did you get any sense of that when you were 
about well, the refuse? Well, you know, there's no doubt that, especially for a lot of people in the climate science field, you know, they're really getting sick of Gray's attack on, on their research and Gray's criticism of the mainstream consensus position, which is that humans are driving global warming, and they tend to be fairly dismissive of some of his arguments. But if you go, you know, into the field of hurricane science and the people who know who Gray is in the field of hurricane science, then you still have definitely this very um, strong respect for everything that he did in his career, and he's got so many students out there um, who obviously learned a lot under him, and all will tell you that he was a great teacher, that he was very stimulating, you know, that he was the reason, uh, in some cases, that they got into this field and they did so well in the field. Um, you mentioned sort of a, an argument of falling out between Gray and one of his top students. Uh, this is Greg Holland, who direct, directs um, the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. So he's now the head of a very major, um, you know, branch of a major meteorological institution, and he disagrees with Gray um, about global warming and about global warming and hurricanes. And that definitely got a little tense um, once uh, once they attended once they divided over the science. Actually, I got to go out uh, to NCAR, to Boulder, and speak there about the book. And Greg Holland was there in the audience, and Bill Gray was there in the audience. And uh, they seemed to get along OK on that occasion. So that actually uh, was kind of a felicitous outcome of my uh, going to speak. So they didn't uh, sort of have the, uh, have the physical confrontation that Gray talked about at one stage? Uh... Oh, they definitely, they had a shouting match, which I kind of tried to reconstruct by asking both uh, what happened, and it didn't, yeah. you know, completely sound exactly the same, but there's no doubt that they had a falling out um, over um, Holland's involvement in a major scientific publication saying hurricanes have measurably intensified, this is closely correlated with rising sea surface temperatures, and therefore at least by implication with global warming, and Gray was extraordinarily critical of this study. Uh, and so, yeah, they argued about it vigorously. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's interesting to me how you structure the book, almost from a dramatic point of view, that you have you know, these interesting personalities. On one hand, you have uh, Bill Gray, you know, sort of, who's uh, sort of, uh, entering his la into his latter years as a scientist, you know, who comes across as being a showman, who's uh, prepared to... Uh, you know, sort of, sometimes uh, the showmanship doesn't work all that well, sometimes it works extremely well, but who uh, effectively uh, sort of is all about you know, sort of, uh, this folksy kind of delivery, or, uh, and and you know, to some extent, I'm sort of wedded to a set of ideas, come hell or high water, who's not commit, who who doesn't show any commitment to uh, revising these ideas in in, in relationship to new data, uh, and who uh, makes some accusations about his fellow scientists, basically being uh, motivated by the uh, desire to get grants, which seem to cause a lot of controversy. Then you have, on the other hand, you have Kerry Manuel, who's uh, sort of in some ways the foil to uh, Gray, who seems to be a much more uh, not necessarily self-effacing person, but certainly per somebody who conducts himself much more in the ways that you would usually ha expect a uh, scientist to conduct themselves. And then you have um, sort of a couple of interesting uh, secondary characters. You have uh, uh, Lancey, who is the um, sort of person who's uh, more skeptical, but uh, still um, sort of very definitely seems to be a responsible and serious scientist. And you have Holland, who's the person who starts believing one thing and then re re uh, revises his uh, opinions when the data come in to suggest that um, sort of his earlier uh, his earlier uh, his earlier ideas about what was happening turned out uh, in fact to be wrong. And it seems to be an interesting way of getting across how it is that science actually happens, that we have this very uh, sort of abstract, idealized idea of science as being a, uh, a process of disinterested search for the truth, and that this can sometimes happen, but that the way that it happens in, uh, as a matter of practice is through argument with people who have different personalities, different points of view, some of whom are much more committed to uh, actually uh, sort of uh, changing and revising their opinions with regard to, uh, as, as, as new data comes in, than perhaps other people might be. Yeah, well, this is science happening in real time in all of its messiness and, you know, to some extent in all of its glory. You know, I think in the end, this is how it has to be when you have a highly politicized topic where the stakes are really high and people disagree. You know, there's going to be different personalities involved. People are going to get angry at each other. People, people are going to, you know, say things in the media that they might not wish to have said if they could take it back and all these kinds of things. Uh, sociologists of, sci of science have long known that science is not a purely objective process, that scientists have personalities. 
that they have backgrounds. They have other people that they know. Uh, they're trained by a certain person that leads them to have a strong affinity to that person's point of view and so forth and so on. I think in the long term it does ultimately shake out for the better. We do know more. Uh, but in the near term, uh, there's definitely going to be conflicts. And one of the interesting things uh, that I learned, uh, you know, reporting on this book and going around to conferences and seeing the scientists, as you mentioned, perform, is that they had very different styles for giving scientific talks. And actually, Gray, you know, clearly, uh, by being something of a, of a celebrity, Gray had learned how to entertain large audiences of people at the National Hurricane Conference every year, the Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference. You know, he's, he's a barrel of laughs. He really is. You know, he knows how to make these crowds sort of roll in the aisles. Uh, and to some extent, Lancey, I think, has picked that up as well. You know, Lancey always starts off a talk with a well-sculpted joke, and it's, it's almost always one that makes everybody sort of crack up. But by contrast, some of the other scientists, you know, especially Emmanuel, I, j I can't see him starting off a talk with a joke. He's, it's not that he's, you know, doesn't have any, you know, sort of flesh or character to him, but rather I think he's just sort of much more reserved as a scientist and much more um, calm and sort of, I'm going to present the data, I'm going to present the analysis, then I'm going to step down. This is how I do it. Which is, well, we'll be getting on to this, I think, in a little while when I want to talk to you more about framing and how some of your arguments about framing of science uh, enters into this. But uh, again, one of the other things that is interesting is that perhaps because of Gray, that some of this was actually seemed to be a circus from the beginning. That is, before it really began to get as much attention in the public space as otherwise, you know, so if you have this uh, effectively this confrontation that you de describe at a major conference between Gray and Emmanuel, where uh, sort of uh, Gray basically cracks him up with jokes and you know, sort of uh, makes it clear what he thinks of the other point of view, and Emmanuel you know, sort of does so, but in a very uh, sort of sober, studious uh, kind of way, in which you know, sort of he makes a uh, sort of a, a slightly passive, aggressive remark. Which basically indicates you know, sort of what he thinks of the uh, you know, sort of what he thinks of the uh, sort of the opposing argument and the, the opposing way of doing things. And they're two very very different styles. Oh, without a doubt, you know, uh, I forget exactly what the year was, but it was before uh, these people were getting near the media attention. They were now Gray and Emmanuel at a hurricane conference of specialists, uh, not, you know, sort of all the emergency managers, but mainly hurricane scientists, did actually debate about what causes hurricanes to intensify. And I think on that occasion, I quote it in the book, uh, Gray said of Emmanuel or something to this effect, you know, he could sell steam heat to the Amazonians and uh, ice to the Eskimos or something like that. You know, it's a line that, that Gray obviously likes uh, when he disagrees with somebody, he'll say, you know, oh, they could sell this, sell any argument. Um, and, and, and that's just, you know, that's not a manual style at all. Uh, you know, Gray definitely keeps it lively, but at the same time, um, by making these kinds of comments and also some of the other comments where he implied that there's a financial incentive for certain researchers to, res to reach certain results that are supportive either of global warming or of the idea that global warming is causing weather catastrophes. Um, you know, Gray has implied that, there, that, that there's financial incentive here, and a lot of other scientists are really offended by that. But it's also, it seems to me, that, and this gets back to the question of the sociology of science, that, there, that this isn't necessarily so much Emmanuel necessarily not knowing how to speak to a large audience, as a sort of crafting his attacks in a different way. You know, sort of my, my, the way that I read that episode, and obviously I wasn't there, I'm relying on your account of it, was that this sounded to me much more like a sort of Emmanuel, you know, sort of by implicitly keeping to the standards of scientific presentation, to the standards of, you know, sort of not directly attacking your fellow scientists, not getting into this, this jocular kind of thing, of using this as a you know, sort of effectively a means of uh, attacking, attacking Gray implicitly. You know, so that in a, in a certain sense, he doesn't have have to say that uh, sort of that Gray can sell uh, steam shovels to whoever he uh, sort of just uh, uh, yes by, by virtue of him not doing that himself of him deliberately sticking to the answer uh, sort of somewhat dry arid scientific style he's trying to signal to his fellow scientists I am a real scientist this guy is a showman oh no sir, without a doubt I mean the norms of the scientific community certainly at a conference are that you know you don't crack a lot of jokes in, in a lot of cases and uh, you don't make personal comments you present the data uh, you let your fellow scientists sort it out and without a um, without a doubt Emmanuel was in this particular instance that I describe in the book he was quite clearly um, adhering to those norms and yeah. you know, all the scientists would have understood that yeah one other thing uh, that that was interesting uh, you you know, so clearly some discussion in the book of how it is that uh, sort of people who disagree with global warming uh, have, uh, sort of have, have very often uh, misrepresented the evidence for one reason or another. But there's also some discussion of how some of the people on the pro-global warming side also have stepped sometimes 
in advance of what the scientific evidence would uh, seem to support. And here in particular I'm thinking about this uh, episode that you describe, describe with Jeff Trenburs, when he uh, sort of, uh, he doesn't quite say it outright, but he seems to imply that there is a direct relationship between global warming and the increased hurricanes that we, uh, that we were observing, a couple, the increase in hurricanes a couple of years ago, and get some sort of uh, vigorously slapped back by Chris Lancey for uh, doing this. And maybe you could talk a little bit more about this and about, the, uh, you know, sort of about what this has to say about uh, how both sides of the debate sometimes uh, can actually engage in uh, public grandstanding that maybe goes a little bit beyond what the science uh, would actually bear. Absolutely. Um, but, but just um, at the outset, let me say that I think that activists and, you know, sort of pundits on both sides of the debate were far worse than, than the two scientists clashing in the way that you described. So, for example, you know, Lancey definitely was, this was the 2004 hurricane season. It was a prelude to the really big blow up following 2005 and during the 2005 hurricane season where Kevin Trenberth, who is a you know, respected climate scientist, again, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, held a press conference at Harvard with a number of other scientists. Uh, and essentially what they did was they, link, they linked hurricanes and global warming right in the wake of the uh, devastation to Florida from four strong hurricanes hitting the state. And Chris Lancey was like, you know, what, what papers have you published on this subject? He, you know, and he vigorously disagreed. And he actually ended up resigning from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, process because Trenberth was um, in involved in that process, and Lancey was arguing that Trenberth couldn't be objective. So this was sort of like, you know, a, a, a prelude to the, to the bigger battle that erupted later. But I, I argue in the book um, that science was misused on both sides of the aisle. It's not like the Republican war on science where I said the Bush administration is definitely really bad in how it treats science, and there hasn't been, as far as we can tell, another administration that's been so cavalier and, and has shown such disregard. But when it comes to hurricanes and global warming, uh, on the one hand, the environmentalists were um, too willing to link global warming to one particular destructive weather event like Katrina, which you can't statistically do. On the other hand, you know, the conservatives were too dismissive outright of the notion that there might be any relationship between hurricanes and global warming, and neither position was defensible. Yeah. And, uh, and Lancey, uh, his accusation, as I recall, uh, I'm just reading from a quote I took down, was that uh, Trembers had been, quote, abusing science in pursuit of a political agenda, which obviously uh, pre-shadowed a whole lot of what was to uh, happen over the next year or two as it began to uh, break out more and ever more from purely scientific debates into the uh, sort of much broader uh, political debates following Florida and especially following Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, so there were falling outs, you know, before we talked about Gray and um, Greg Holland, his student, having a fallout over hurricanes and global warming, but even before that was the, the trendberth lancy argument, and I, I was actually at the 2007 American Meteorological Society conference, which was held in San Antonio in January, and uh, <laughs> the panel was set up so that Lancey spoke and then Trenberth spoke actually both about hurricanes, and I was looking to see if there was going to be any sort of exchange between them, but again, they adhered to the norms of the scientific community, and they you know, didn't say anything to one another, they just sort of walked past each other as they were um, trading the podium. Yeah, uh, which brings me to something that I was interested in. The, the one, mo most of the book you do a pretty good job in maintaining a pretty uh, scrupulous um, sort of appearance of fairness and of balance and of seeking to give each side its voice and not necessarily engaging in all that much editorializing from uh, your privileged place as a person who's writing the book. But the one place where you don't do that, uh, where you, you really cut, an anger comes out is with, in relationship to Hurricane Katrina and to New Orleans, where you talk about how there was no excuse for uh, Bush or for FEMA, quote, uh, and I quote directly, to be so fundamentally unprepared, so clueless. Now this, I presume, isn't something that uh, you, you had clearly been researching this area before this all came to pass, but uh, this must have clearly and sort of coloured uh, colored this in a very personal and very unique way for you because obviously you're somebody who comes from New Orleans and not only that but uh, this is something you don't mention in the book you're somebody who had written a sort of very powerful very tough piece on how it was that uh, we really needed to do something about storm protections in New Orleans because if not a major disaster was going to hit and you actually wrote this and published this some months before the uh, some months before uh, Katrina actually arrived so how did you know, sort of per, how did your pers personal history and, sort of the, and, and the history of New Orleans intersect with the stuff that you're writing, the stuff that you're researching? 
Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, without a doubt, the fact that I'd grown up in New Orleans, that I'd watched my mother evacuate from hurricanes uh, long before Katrina, and that after Hurricane Ivan, Miss New Orleans would posed um, for at least some time a threat, that, you know, perhaps in some ways worse than Katrina if it had stayed on course. Um, I wrote about the vulnerability of New Orleans. It was eventually published about 100 days before, and I talked about how we could fill the bowl of the city and you know, all the rest, and a lot of the similar to uh, many of the things that ultimately did happen. And at least the BBC thought I was a prophet, and they had me on you know, sort of repeatedly for interviews, but the U.S. media recognized there had been about 50 or more prophets, and so I didn't do any U.S. Yeah. media interviews after that because this had been predicted for so long, uh, you know, and how you can be unaware of this. And not only predicted in the past, but the National Hurricane Center looking at Katrina, you know, tracking what this storm could do to New Orleans, was there saying in the days beforehand, this could be a disaster, this could be a disaster. Uh, how you missed that, I don't know, except uh, except by being incompetent. Yeah, well, this is, you know, chronicle of disaster foretold, and this, uh, I, I guess, it also touches on some of the discussions that we've been having in the U.S. in the last couple of weeks over infrastructure, infrastructure under development and under investment, and all of these kinds of things. But there's also an interesting uh, public policy debate that's happening here, where on the one hand, clearly a lot of people argue that this demonstrates uh, the uh, problems of underinvestment in certain kinds of uh, key infrastructure that you need to protect against this. And on the other hand, you have people like uh, Roger Pielke, if, my, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, I've never heard it said. Roger Pielke, uh, Jr.? Yeah, yeah. Who, who basically, uh, and also Lancy, who are arguing, who argue that we uh, we need instead to think about the uh, patterns of uh, of our the patterns of urban development and how crazy it is that so much of our sort of urban uh, uh, important urban areas are built up around coasts and uh, sort of what kinds of uh, what what this says about a sort of public. You know, so, so 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 you've got two quite different points of view on what this says about the public policy take home that we should have, either develop infrastructure or else sort of discourage people from uh, settling and living in certain places. And this also, I think, has some in implications for New Orleans because of this uh, big debate over whether or not we should go back in there and rebuild the city uh, or else whether uh, some people argue uh, uh, it, it was a bad idea to build a city there in the first place. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm not so sure that these are two uh, camps that definitely disagree about everything. So, for example, Roger Pilkey Jr., Chris Lancy, and the other hurricane scientists would agree with this, say that the number one reason for hurricane vulnerability in the United States is not whatever global warming may be doing, but rather it is the stampede uh, of persons and property towards vulnerable coastal areas. The scientists have called it our lemming-like march to the sea. And if you put a lot of people in harm's way, then the storms are inevitably going to come and you're going to have much more damage and or loss of life than you would have if you didn't put them in harm's way. Um, but, you know, that said, once they're in harm's way, what are the policy implications? Well, you've got to work on evacuation planning, you've got to have better building codes, and so forth. But also, you might want to invest, and I, I support this, certainly for New Orleans, as well as for other vulnerable cities that don't get enough attention. Um, you know, you might want to invest in really expensive infrastructure because um, it's, we, we, we simply cannot permit as a country, or I don't think we should be able to permit as a country, um, the kind of devastation that we saw in New Orleans. Unfortunately, yeah. the Bush administration does not treat this as a priority, so you're not going to get large amounts of funding of the sort that you would need in order to really build you know, some sort of seawall or something like that that's going to knock down a hurricane storm surge. Um, but, you know, as John McQuaid wrote uh, in the Washington Post uh, maybe a week ago or something like that, part of this shows that in some sense the United States has become the can't-do nation. You know, we used to plan big. We would, we're going to put someone on the moon. We're going to build an interstate highway system. We're going to do the New Deal. We're going to win world wars. Uh, now we're just like, oh, no, we can't possibly uh, protect a city that's below sea level. And that, you know, I really, it's, it's really sad to me that we've gotten to the point where we think in that way. And without getting into the... Uh Part of the politics of this, a lot of this has to do, I think, with the uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, sort of the idea that the uh, most terrifying words that you hear are, we're here from the government to help you, and the idea that, you know, so without government, the, there isn't the necessary basis for very large scale infrastructural uh, projects like this, and uh, political scientists, of which I claim to be one, have a pretty good set of arguments worked out about this, you know, so why it is that collective action, you know, sort of, uh, which involves you know, sort of large scale things like this, is extremely hard for individuals to do on their own without some element of, uh, without some element of organization, perhaps even of compulsion, that the government can do, can bring to bear, in order to say, you know, sort of, well, if all of you individual people won't do this on your own, 
we will and we must provide whatever is necessary to uh, you know, to protect whatever it is that needs to be protected. Yeah, well, I guess I'm in the I'm in the protect and I, camp, and I don't see how you can do it without a government. And uh, you know, so that's what has to be done in New Orleans. The Corps of Engineers is moving slowly, but at least they're uh, supposedly factoring global warming into an assessment of long-term risks. I think we need to to really focus on the fact, though, that while New Orleans is probably our most hurricane vulnerable American city, there are a lot of others that, that are close runners up, and those include Houston, Galveston, Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg, uh, Miami, many parts of North Carolina, all the way on up to New York City. And, you know, sure, New Orleans could get hit again, it could be bad again, but we could also see a disaster in one of these other cities, and people aren't even really even thinking about that right now. Yeah, I find that Galveston in particular, you know, so given that massive flood when was it back in 1910, the early years of the century. Yeah, uh, 1900, know, I believe. I forget 1900. Exactly. Yeah, yeah the, the, it's, it's, it's extraordinary that the, uh, you know, so the people, people just seem to be, uh, you know, it's, it's like people, I guess, of sort of gambling and of sort of knowing that the odds are, you know, of each year, a couple of percent, you know, a, a, a real and appreciable chance, and sooner or later the you know, if the bill is going to come due and Galveston is going to get hit again, but there doesn't seem to be anything happening. This again seems to me to suggest problems with the way that uh, Americans think, think about government. And, and think, think about of, risk, yeah. Yeah. Think about long-term risk. All too often, you know, we wait for the train wreck to happen, and then we're like, oh, my God, and then we point to all the people who predicted it happening long ago. And that was the story with New Orleans. It's been the story with so many other things. And so people like me are sort of shouting, we have lots of hurricane vulnerable cities. You know, who's assessing the risk and how they change under global warming, and who's thinking about uh, whether there's going to be some sort of long term protection strategy, or whether we're just going to say the bad storm's going to come eventually, and then, oh no, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, well, this is uh, the classic uh, sort of uh, bolting the uh, barn door after the uh, sort of force is gone. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, obviously. Europeans tend to have a different attitude to this. Uh, the uh, what's called the precautionary principle, and that has its own uh, has its own problems with re with regard to things like, for example, uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, but at the same time, you're know, sort of trying to at least begin to take account of substantial long term risks, especially when they hold an enormous downside. Seems to me to be an incredibly important an incredibly important thing, but also something that gets uh, completely uh, neglected for political reasons in the uh, in the US um, in the US system. I think the best statement of this uh, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be an interview with you, but I'm going off on one of my own hobby courses here. Well it's an important but, one. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, David Stock David Stockman, the uh, famous um, budget guy back in the Reagan administration, was asked about some policy. I can't remember exactly what it was, which would have, uh, you know, which was pretty nice now, but would have very substantial and sort of uh, negative uh, negative uh, implications down the road. And his re his uh, reaction, at least as reported by Paul Pearson, a political scientist, was uh, something along the lines of, excuse the language, quote. Why the fuck should I sort of expend my political capital on some other guy's problem 20 years from now? Unquote. And, um, it's the same true for global warming, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And depressing, I guess, by the time that a lot of this stuff bites. Uh, many of the people on both sides of the aisle who have been responsible for blocking progress on this uh, will be uh, safely retired or safely dead. Well, some of us will remember who they were. Yeah. Um, moving on to the uh, to uh, topic of framing, which is something we touched upon a moment ago, I want to talk about this piece that you that you uh, co-wrote with Nisbet, which was uh, about framing and science, which attracted a lot of attention, uh, by no means all of it uh, positive, from scientists in the blogosphere. And uh, talk a little bit about uh, your arguments about framing, and then I want to bring that back to some of what you say about uh, the specific question of, uh, of climate change and of hurricanes. Sure. So well, uh, Nisbet and I co-authored uh, a policy forum article from your that was published in and, Science. Uh, and in it, what and we were FYI trying to address was how scientists how communicate on a relatively small number of very yeah. important politicized scientific subjects. So we're never talking about all scientific subjects, but just Hello. the ones that get really high levels of political attention and controversy surrounding them. So uh, evolution, global climate change, embryonic stem cell research, the relationship between hurricanes and global warming would be one of those as well. And what we said Hello. was that in this context, scientists uh, too often seem to think 
that they can simply lay the facts out there uh, and then good policies will result and increased public understanding will result. But in fact, that's not how non-scientists use information. And in fact, they... Hi, sorry, we got disconnected there for a moment. Yep, we're back. Any, anyway, the question I wanted to ask you was about framing and to talk a little bit about this uh, other piece that you wrote uh, with Nisbet, which was all about framing for scientists and how scientists needed to understand better how to frame their arguments in public debate. And this is a piece which, uh, let's just say, uh, met with a somewhat controversial reaction among many uh, scientists in the blogosphere, a lot of uh, vigorous attacks. And maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, and then after that I want to uh, sort of bring this back around again to the question of how framing specifically connects to the uh, issues of uh, climate change and of hurricane science. Absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that it did create sort of a, a lot of controversy. We found we've been giving public talks about the subject, and we actually um, lay it out in a public lecture format, we find that there's actually much less controversy. We get to explain it that way than sort of when it's in the blogosphere, um, where there's sort of a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of misunderstanding of what we're trying to argue. But in any event, I'll sort of lay out basically what the case is. And we published this in a policy forum article in Science back in uh, pretty much, it was early April, I believe. Um, what we argued was that with certain scientific topics, the strategy that scientists use to communicate is not probably the best one. And the topics we were focusing on were the highly politicized ones where there's high levels of media coverage and a lot of controversy. So in other words, issues like evolution, global climate change, embryonic stem cell research, the hurricane global warming debate would definitely fit into this context as well. And what we said was that with these issues, scientists sort of default to a communication strategy that might be dubbed just the facts. In other words, we're going to educate the public about the technical aspects of the science, and there's a presumption this will increase public understanding, public acceptance of the science, maybe make controversy go away, maybe make policy making and, and decision making easier. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be how it really works when you have a highly politicized debate, because people um, who are not scientists don't approach scientific information in the same way. And so when they're making up their minds about scientific information, they're often uh, what Matthew Nisbet calls cognitive misers. In other words, they're not deeply informed about the science. They're not walks on the subject. And none of us are walks on every subject. Some scientists don't even uh, know a lot about fields of science other than their own. So rather, people make up their minds based upon sort of more subtle factors, cues, heuristics, what their neighbor told them, you know, what Bill O'Reilly says if they trust Bill O'Reilly, what a liberal commentator says if they tend to trust a liberal commentator, and they sort of quickly use these cues, these shortcuts, to figure out what they think. And so the only way to reach audiences like this is to understand how they make up their minds. And so therefore, you really have to pare down the information, and you have to frame it and shape it in some sort of way that will resonate with the core values of the audience that you're speaking to. And that's very different from the way that scientists traditionally think about communicating on scientific subjects. Well, in particular, when you talk, you talk a little bit about this uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of Storm World, and you make a couple of points. You, know, you, you say that uh, scientists, you know, who come in with the just the facts man kind of approach, uh, they're like uh, they're like uh, people who are trying to adhere to boxing rules in a kickboxing match, and naturally enough, they get the stuffing uh, beaten out of them. Or maybe even they, ultimate uh, fighting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe even ultimate fighting, but uh, but 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 yes, but we're not talking about Marquis of King Queensbury rules here. This is a, this is a uh, fairly vigorous debate, and you also give some examples of this, you know, sort of of, of scientists who uh, release what they think are uh, sort of uh, neutralist scientific findings, and then find themselves getting uh, sort of uh, getting uh, phone calls uh, from journalists and uh, sucked into a maelstrom of controversy, which they didn't which they didn't, uh, didn't predict happening and which they certainly don't have much training or experience in dealing with. But there's something that I wanted to uh, push you a little bit on here, which is that you say that the problem with the, uh, one of the problems with the uh, debate over storms and uh, global warming is that this has gotten framed around the uh, sort of issue of uncertainty. You know, that, 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 the, uh, that, that, that it got framed around the uh, sort of issue of uncertainty and the areas where, uh, where there was a sort of disagreement and all of that. And you say that uh, that the you know, so that scientists, if they've been thinking of their feet, should have framed it. You know, should have been thinking about how to frame this, and they should have framed it in a different way. But what I what I I'm not sure if this really uh, gels for me because one of the things that really came home to me from the uh, from the uh, sort of from the book is that 
scientific uncertainty and the, uh, sort of the willingness of scientists to uh, change their opinions is actually uh, sort of one of the uh, sort of one of the things that makes science into a worthwhile activity. So that, for example, you get your Ram Manuel, or not not Ram. I keep on saying that Kerry Manuel uh, changing his mind when he uh, realized when further data comes in, which suggests that some of his earlier predictions may have gone a bit too far. You get Greg Holland originally starting off on one side of the debate and ending up on the other. You get uh, you get uh, Lancey. Uh, also, um, sort of uh, modifying his views substantially, and sort of when the uh, when the uh, facts change, and you know, so this is all about, in a certain sense, how these people are willing to uh, maintain, in a certain way, a certain level of uncertainty, a certain willingness to modify their minds, to change their minds, and to recognize the areas in which there is still uh, sort of a, an awful lot of scientific uncertainty, an awful lot of doubt. So. I see what you're trying to do here, and I can also see how scientific uncertainty and disagreement among scientists is strategically manipulated by people outside, and this is something that you talk about at much greater lengths, obviously, in the uh, Republican War on Science. But how do you how do you do this without reverting back to the uh, sort of to the 1950s men in white coats, you know, sort of thing where scientists are viewed as being uh, you know, sort of father figures? They're all of these guys you who know, sort of in white coats who tell you tell you what's this and what's that. How, in other words, do you represent uh, sort of science? fairly in the public debate, represent all of its, uh, sort of its tribulations, its uncertainty, the fact that in a certain way it's committed to a radical kind of uncertainty in which everybody has to change their, um, sort of change their uh, sort of point of view, change their beliefs when the evidence comes in. How do you represent that while on the other hand uh, sort of not giving, uh, not giving uh, sort of levers to those who would uh, sort of abuse this uh, uncertainty in ways that further their, their specific political agendas. Well, I think that uh, the way through and, and your point about scientists um, holding knowledge as tentative and being willing to change their minds and this being something unique about science is, is a very valid one and it's one of the things that I love about science and that I think makes science you know, so powerful as a way of thinking and approaching the world. But, um, but in order to address your question, I think we have to think about how scientific information is used in different contexts. So among scientists, when you just have a conversation between scientists or maybe a conversation that's happening in print in a, in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, there's no doubt uh, that scientists especially really prize the willingness of other researchers to change their mind when they see new information, uh, when someone sort of wins an argument uh, against them. If scientists are seen as flexible and holding knowledge as tentative and willing to move their positions, this is definitely something that um, other scientists really respect. And so in that sense, you know, the, the understanding of uncertainty, the understanding that knowledge is tentative, is an incredibly important aspect of science that I wouldn't want to denigrate. But in a political context, in a media context, um, it's uncertainty can be framed as conflict. And uncertainty can also be very unmotivating. Um, average citizens who um, react to media coverage that just depict scientists as fighting all the time can get the sense that, oh, there are no solutions here. We don't know what we can do. We have to wait until the scientists figure it all out. And that's unrealistic. So when you move to the media context, you move out of the context of scientists talking to one another where uncertainty is properly understood, uh, I say that sometimes you have to realize, especially when things are politicized, uncertainty gets misused. And it gets misused in order to create political inaction. Uh, and so you have to shift the frame away from uncertainty or away from conflict and say, you know what, maybe scientists disagree about some things um, and maybe there is uncertainty here, but nevertheless there might be answers that aren't purely scientific that we can move forward with. Uh, even in the presence of uncertainty. And that would be true for um, the relationship between global warming and hurricanes, where we really need to protect the coasts, no matter what global warming is doing to hurricanes. Uh, it would be true for the broader global warming debate as well, where we can actually, um, there's not nearly as much uncertainty about whether humans are driving the current temperature trend. Uh, but nevertheless, we can also, again, get out of the scientific argument, and in some case, move towards policy discussions. Yeah, uh, so what you're suggesting, in a sense, is not to deny the uncertainty, but to downplay it 
in favor of, uh, sort of other aspects and in favor of the practical thing that we do or don't need to do? Well, you can candidly admit it, and I don't think any scientist asked, you know, in the hurricane global warming debate, um, do other scientists disagree with you, would say no. You know, I don't think they would say there is no uncertainty in this debate. You're never going to get a scientist to say that. Scientists love uncertainty. Uncertainty equals research opportunities, and this is what drives scientists in order to do their very best work. Um, what I'm saying is that scientists ought to be aware of a different context in which uncertain information gets used, and they ought to realize that if it is just depicted in the media, in the political system, as a controversy and as a fight all the time, this might actually detract from the existing information, which may be laden with uncertainty but still has policy relevance. It might prevent that information from being used in the best possible way to find policy relevant solutions immediately. And so in that context, scientists have to be aware that if they only talk about uncertainty, then they're just staying in this frame that can be very um, prone to creating political paralysis. But if they're willing to talk about issues in different ways, they can in some cases get out of the paralysis by analysis trap and get us towards some common ground solutions. So again, global warming, there's scientific uncertainty, sorry, global warming and hurricanes, there's scientific uncertainty about the relationship. However, for the United States, the most immediate policy implication is we're vulnerable because we have so many people uh, who have stampeded toward the coasts. And that's something that could be addressed even as the scientific research continues. Okay, so in a certain sense, I think of the uh, Ron Susskind book, the uh, what the, the two percent doctrine or something, which is about uh, Dick Cheney's uh, claim that if there's a two percent risk of X, that we ought to act as if X is sort of going to happen, and uh, that's because clearly, also, first of all, that's something which uh, Cheney seems rather happier to apply to uh, issues such as uh, sort of terrorist threats than to uh, issues such as global warming. Absolutely. But we're, yeah, but we're looking for something which is um, sort of uh, perhaps between that and between the uh, paralysis uh, by analysis uh, uh, problem, uh, looking for something effectively which is prepared to uh, you know, sort of put in place some sort of meaningful policy changes as necessary to uh, sort of deal with potential threats which uh, are serious, but which, uh, well, of which the sort of probability uh, sort of can't exactly be measured. Uh, and that clearly, the problem is, of course, that's clearly going to take not only major changes in uh, communication strategies on the part of scientists, but major changes in uh, how policy actually gets formulated in the U.S. And uh, again, there, do, there seems to be very little, and this is something that you document in, the, uh, in your previous book, there seems to be very little in the way of a apparatus within Congress and to a lesser extent within the administration for translating scientific knowledge into, uh, into, uh, sort of into policy implications in a way that would actually allow people to uh, deal with some of these issues and figure out and sort of what we ought to do on the basis of the knowledge that we have in perfect though it may be. Oh, well, absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to, by saying scientists should do more, scientists should do X, I don't want to be heard as saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with the way politicians use science, there's nothing wrong with the way the media covers science, there's nothing wrong with the way the public apprehends it. I mean, there's problems in all, different kinds of problems in all of these different sectors. So politicians often too cavalier with scientific information, want to use it to score political points, rather than really understand it and grapple with the uncertainty inherent in it, and then proceed through the uncertainty to find the right answer. The media, all too often looking for a fight between scientists, rather than wanting to cover some of the policy implications, which might not be as sexy and might not create as much fireworks, yeah. but might be more productive, again, for society, if we had this kind of coverage. And scientists, they're, you know, they're really great at creating valuable um, policy-relevant information, but their gap um, or their deficiency is often communicating it. So everybody has got to get better if we're going to make this sort of science, politics, media mess, um, you know, untangle, uh, you know, how, how naughty it has become. So, uh, uh, so in other words, you're criticizing your own folks a little bit, science journalists, for concentrating a little bit too much on the Emmanuel versus Gray knockout match of the century aspect of these things, and not enough on uh, sort of the situations where there is, real science, uh, there is real consensus, or where at least there are important issues that we need to address. Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of like the third leg of the stool. So I, you know, in Republican War on Science, I was slamming politicians and political advocates for misusing scientific information. In pieces I'd written for Columbia Journalism Review and elsewhere, I was criticizing the media, and it's not just science journalists, it's often political journalists writing about science 
for, you know, not constructing their stories, right? You know, constructing a phony debate over global warming, which doesn't really exist in the scientific community, even a phony debate over evolution, which doesn't exist within the scientific community, but sort of defaulting to that conflict frame, which the media too often does. But then the third leg is what is the role of scientists, and can they be communicating better as well? And, and the answer is that everybody can get better. So I feel like I've addressed all of uh, the different deficiencies. On the uh, question of, you know, so this, uh, trying to address some sort of these issues in the conflict mode, you said that things are getting better in the, uh, this is a piece you wrote for the Huffington Post uh, some weeks ago, you think that things are actually getting better in the media, that the media is uh, sort of moving away from the uh, find of sort of one, uh, you know, fi finding a couple of cranks on the one side and finding you know, sort of the scientific community on the other side and presenting this as a, uh, as a you know, sort of contest in which both sides effectively are, you know, so that, 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 that they're to be given equal voice and that it's moving much more towards us of actually accepting their climate issues, that there is a, a real consensus on climate change and that this, is this something that you still think is happening? Yeah, and I, I must admit that my perspective is anecdotal. So in other words, people have crunched data on patterns of media coverage of global warming over time. And, you know, I suspect that the data, if crunched uh, for more recent years, would support what I'm saying, but uh, I actually haven't, haven't done the work. And, uh, you know, actually, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that the work has been published. But in, in essence, there's a famous study by Boykoff and Boykoff. I believe it's 2004, uh, the journal Global Environmental Change. I'm not sure. But they crunched data on major U.S. newspapers and how they covered global warming between, uh, I think it was 1988 and 2002. And they found that more than 50 percent of coverage was roughly balanced between um, two different perspectives, one of them which one of which is global warming is predominantly human cause and another of which was uh, this is just sort of a natural cycle. And to cover that um, in a 50-50 balanced way became increasingly inaccurate over that time period as a scientific consensus was forged that this is predominantly human cause. But the journalists didn't ref reflect the growing scientific consensus. They stayed in their balance frame, uh, their conflict frame in some sense, and so they more and more misrepresented the state of scientific understanding. I think that probably since 2002 that has changed. I think the global warming issue itself has turned uh, dramatically over the past several years. You know, I think there was a USA Today cover story that I mentioned in that Huffington Post piece um, where, that was entitled, Debate is Over, Globe is Warming. And that is more likely, I think, now to be the journalistic approach. They don't um, treat it as a debate any longer. And the reason that's changed, and there will be counterexamples, but I think we're talking about the predominant coverage. And the reason that's changed is complicated, but uh, without any doubt, there's been mounting scientific evidence. There's been mounting political consensus uh, as well, to some extent, about at least the reality of the problem. And there have been a lot of other um, events. Uh, ranging from Al Gore's emergence on this issue uh, as sort of our leading public intellectual with an inconvenient truth and all the rest to Hurricane Katrina. A lot of stuff has changed since then. Um, there's also, you've talked about three legs of the stool here, and there's something you talk about a little bit in the book is a fourth leg, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, which means that it's not a stool anymore, but a conventional chair, uh, which is uh, the uh, role that blogs and the blogosphere play in this. So this is something which is pretty clear in the answer of debate over climate science and also over science more generally. And you could argue this in two ways. So first of all, it's, uh, this, this allows scientists to uh, communicate directly with the public. It trains them, in a sense, in communicating directly with the public in a much more, uh, in a much more straightforward manner than perhaps they've done in the past. And you see this at blogs such as Real Climate, which, uh, yes, yeah, so where, where uh, sort of, yes, yeah, so this is uh, much more direct and sort of much, uh, much more frank than uh, perhaps a uh, sort of traditional uh, journal article might be. But on the other hand, you also see the blogosphere becoming the, the uh, means through which a lot of uh, nonsense becomes injected into the public debate. And we saw an interesting example of this uh, some days ago when it was revealed that there was a very slight and sort of error which had been made in, uh, in uh, sort of figures for, uh, sort of the, uh, for the United States, for the uh, 48 states and for their, uh, sort of for their weather a couple of years ago, which was uh, sort of transformed by certain parts, uh, you know, so I would say the crazies of the, uh, in certain parts of the blogosphere, into a supposed major scientific controversy, which was a major blow to people who claimed that global warming was happening, and uh, pretty clearly to anybody who had actually followed this debate, this was a storm in a teacup. This was something which, uh, which didn't change anything that was uh, sort of at all important and which didn't really uh, sort of change the uh, scientific debate over global warming uh, one jot or one tittle. What do, you, 
you know, I know this is a, a big, vague, broad question, but uh, could you talk a little bit about the role of the blogosphere, about the role of blogs, about the way, whether you think in the long term they're going to have positive consequences or negative consequences for the uh, for debates over this kind of issue? Well, you know, it's 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 not either or, right? Of course, I mean, there's some blogs, uh, and you mentioned Real Climate, and certainly that would be one great example where there's an incredibly high level discussion of science uh, with experts. It's incredibly valuable discourse. And um, it also brings real scientists, you know, leaders of the field into dialogue with sort of more amateurish people um, who know a lot, but they're not necessarily based at universities and this isn't their day job. But that's a productive kind of conversation to be having. Well, on the other hand, you know, there's um, definitely the potential for the blogosphere to churn along quite a great deal of misinformation, and we saw that as well. So it's, it's not an either or, uh, and, you know, I guess those of us who read a lot of blogs, you know, gravitate towards the ones where we think the discussion is serious. In the case of the NASA example, you know, I saw this coming across the transom, and I was just like, yeah, right, you know, it, it, global warming is not going to be overturned just all of a sudden because of a data glitch. Um, there's huge amount of interlocking bodies of evidence from a variety of different fields that all support the theory, and you can't, you know, undermine all the fields simultaneously by detecting one error. It's just not possible. Okay, well, final question, I guess. Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, is there another book in the works? What is, what is it likely to be about? Well, that's a question I can't answer, and not out of coyness, but just because, uh, you know, having worked pretty hard on Republican War on Science and Stormworld, I'm a little burned out, and uh, we're now, you know, in approaching uh, the really heavy part of the Atlantic hurricane season. And uh, so for the time being, I'm sort of going to focus on hurricanes and sort of talking about the book. And there definitely will be another book. It uh, uh, pretty assuredly will be about science in uh, some sort of uh, fashion and perhaps uh, its interaction with politics. But I have not, I have not picked the subject, and so unfortunately can't uh, tell you at this point. Okay, well, uh, it's been great talking to you, Chris. I am uh, waving around a copy of the book on uh, the uh, screen again, Thank you. Uh, available from all good bookstores. And this has just been a great conversation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you as well. Okay, talk to you soon. Talk to you later.